Mickey, stop reading back there. <laughs> yeah, Mickey's got a great reading voice. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. We're so good. It's so good to see each and every one of you. We're always thankful for these opportunities that we have to be with one another. Always thankful to worship God in spirit and in truth. And we, we are in November. And whenever we get to November, uh, a lot of people are, are big into uh, Halloween. But I think Thanksgiving is probably my favorite. Uh, of the holidays. Uh, I, I love that time of family, and certainly I love food. That doesn't hurt at all, but certainly a time of the year that, that I certainly love, and certainly a time where we can certainly think, hopefully, about thankfulness. Certainly a topic we should be thinking about year-round, but thinking about thankfulness as, uh, as we uh, go about our lives. And certainly when we think about thankfulness in so many ways, uh, we're so thankful for the individuals that serve here at Sandyville and the different roles that we have. We're so thankful for our Bible class teachers, so thankful for our, our men that, that serve and in, in, uh, in worship and, and those kind of leadership roles. We're so thankful for that. But the thing about thankfulness that I think many times when we reflect on ourselves is so many times we take things for granted. We take things for granted that are right there in front of us, that we get to be around each and every day, those things that, that are consistent, those things that, that seem to always be there. And so many times, I think we find times where we, we take things for granted. And as we look at, at Psalm 136, that's where we're going to spend all of our time, is when we think of the Psalms, you know, these were, were songs. Now, certainly when we translate things, they don't perhaps flow quite as well. But we do realize that these were once sung at one time. And certainly the ideas within are many ideas that we find in our own songs that we'll sing here uh, as we assemble together to sing praises to God. But I think in Psalm 136, we find something that many times we take for granted. God himself. You know, we, we, take, we talk about taking for granted uh, our loved ones, taking for granted the time we have, taking for granted many of those things, but have you ever thought that you perhaps take God for granted? What if we took God out of the equation of your life? If we just took God and we set him aside and say, God's not going to be a part of your life anymore, think of all that we would lose. Do we take for granted so many of those things that God has given us? Certainly thinking about thankfulness, but thinking about thankfulness to God this morning. Thankfulness should be a trait of a Christian. People that don't take things for granted, people that are focused on the things that they should be focused upon. We don't have to read too far in the letters of the New Testament before we find that idea of thankfulness come up again and again and again. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18 it says, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Are you thankful? Are you thankful for all those things that are around us? Are you thankful for the physical things, but also the spiritual things? In Colossians chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, Continue, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Are our prayers thankful? In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Are you a thankful person? Are you thankful for all the physical blessings, the spiritual blessings? Are there things that we overlook? And what I want to look at is perhaps some things that we overlook when it comes to God. Psalm 136, if you'll turn over there, we'll just take it one piece at a time. You're going to see that this psalm has a pattern to it. Is after each statement, almost every time, it has a pattern where it says... Uh, the steadfast love of the Lord endures forever. Or it says the mercy of the Lord endures forever. So it goes line, and then it has that repetition. Line, and then that repetition. The steadfast love of the Lord endures forever, or the mercy of God endures forever. But I just want to look at those first three verses as we look at our first point that we might take for granted when it comes to God. Do you thank God? Do you thank God for being God? Let's look at those first three verses. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. And then we have that repetition, For the steadfast love endures forever. Your version might say mercy. It says, Give thanks to the God of gods, for the steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His steadfast love endures forever. Question, do we take for granted the God whom we serve? Right there in the first verse, it says that God, 
He is good. It says, give thanks to God for he is good. Are you thankful for God and his characteristics and his attributes? There's a lot of people and there's a lot of false gods out there. Are you thankful for the God of the Bible? Are you thankful for his characteristics and his attributes? His goodness, his greatness. Do you give thanks to God for just being God? You know, this is a repetition, really, that we actually see throughout the Bible. In another psalm, in Psalm 100 and verse 5, it says, For the Lord is good, His mercy is everlasting, and His truth endures to all generations. Isn't the God that we serve good? He has good characteristics. He has love. He has forgiveness. He has mercy. He has grace. He has so many of these attributes that we strive to have in our own lives, and so many times we see ourselves fall short. He's perfect when it comes to his forgiveness. He's perfect when it comes to his mercy. He's perfect when it comes to his grace. He's perfect when it comes to his love. He's perfect when it comes to his kindness. Truly the God that we serve, he is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. What a blessing that is that God has made sure that his truth has been preserved throughout time. Something that we think could possibly be destroyed or lost, God has preserved for people throughout time that we all have a way to find the God of heaven. God is good. God does not lie. Isn't that a great blessing? God is not a liar. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, it says that God doesn't lie. And what has He promised us? He's promised us eternal life. He's promised us salvation. A God who cannot lie. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18, it says it's impossible for God to lie. God is good. Are you thankful for the God which we serve? A God that cannot lie. A God that is consistent. A God that forgives. A God that has mercy. A God that has all these abundance of attributes. Or have we forgotten God? Do we take for granted the God which we serve and all the attributes and characteristics that he brings to the table? In Psalm 34 and verse 8 it says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Do you trust in the God of the Bible? Do you trust in his words? Do you understand all of his attributes all combined into one, a God which we serve, that has all these attributes that are so beautiful that many times we take for granted. Do we take for granted the forgiveness of God? Do we take for granted the grace of God? Do we take for granted the mercy of God? Do we take for granted God's truth that he has made sure is preserved for us, that we can all come together and be unified? Paul was making a plea to the church at Corinth, and it was a plea that I don't think was in vain. He believed it was possible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Was he pleading for the impossible? No, it's possible with what God has left for us. A God that is good. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. The one God of the Bible. A God that reigns. In Psalm 99 and verse 1, it says, The Lord reigns, let the people tremble. Certainly there are so many good qualities of God, but in the New Testament it says, Behold the goodness and severity of God. Certainly there are good attributes that are, that are wonderful, but certainly we understand that not only does God have these awesome and amazing good attributes, but also he has authority, he has power, he has greatness that is associated with his name. It says the Lord reigns, let the people tremble. Do people tremble anymore when it comes to God? Do they tremble at his words? Do they think that God means what he says? Or do they just take it as a passing word in their life? It doesn't, it's almost like just somebody randomly says something, it's like, well, I'm not going to put that word above any other word. Do we appreciate the God which we have? And we think of the God and we think of of his attributes and, and we think of these good attributes and do we take these for granted? Because from these attributes really flow the blessings of life. We think of James chapter 1 and verse 17. It says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of t- or turning. It says every good gift and every perfect gift is from God. Why do those gifts come from God? Because of so so many of those amazing attributes that he has. When we think of forgiveness, when we think of mercy, when we think of grace, when we think of his kindness, when we think of those attributes, that leads to many of the blessings that we have in our lives. Another day to live. Another day to serve. 
Those qualities lead to the blessings in our lives. Are you thankful for the gifts that you have received from God? Or do you take those for granted as well? In Acts chapter 17 and verse 25, it says, Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needs anything, since he gives life, breath, and all things. How many times have we taken for granted the life which we have? Another day of life. How many times have we taken for granted our next breath? We just expect that next breath to be there, another blessing from God. All things come from God. Do we take these things for granted? Certainly we talk about all those people that are around us. We don't want to take those individuals for granted. But do we take God for granted? If you take God out of your life, how much do you lose? You lose the forgiveness. You lose the mercy. You lose the grace. You lose the love. You lose the kindness. You start to realize all the physical blessings that are tied to God, that are connected to God. We're not getting another step. We're not getting another day of life. We're not getting another breath without God above. Does He receive the proper credit and do? Are we thankful for even the blessing of another day? Are we thankful for a blessing of another breath? Are we thankful for those things which God has given? You know, it probably wouldn't be a bad thing if we thank God before we ate. It probably wouldn't be a bad thing if we we thank God on our lunch break. It probably wouldn't be a bad thing if we thank God in public. It wouldn't be a bad thing if we thank God in private because when we really break it down, we understand that God has credit for so many things, really all things in our life, life, breath, and all things. What does God not get some degree of credit for in our lives? And yet, how many times could we slip into being prideful? Look at all these things that I've accumulated. Look at all the things that I've done. Look at all my achievements. Well, you're not doing too much without life and breath. (laughs) Are we thankful for which God has given? We have been richly and bountifully blessed. In Psalm 68, verse 19, it says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us up with benefits, the God of our salvation. How many daily blessings does God give you? He daily loads us up with benefits. You know, when you start to think of that description, you know, somebody will say, I'm going to load you up. And usually when somebody loads you up, you might have a truck that's overflowing or or you have a bag that's overflowing. Let me load you up before you leave. My grandma would always try to do that before I left the house. She said, let me load you up with these goodies or something, you know. And, And it's like it's more than I can carry. The God that we serve daily loads us up with benefits. That we're almost like bending down. God has loaded us with so many benefits, but the problem is, is we've had those benefits and those blessings so long, do we take them for granted? Do we take for granted the characteristics and the qualities of our God that leads to the blessings which we have and enjoy? Our physical and spiritual blessings. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. All spiritual blessings. It doesn't seem like there's any spiritual blessings outside. But all those spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. All the physical blessings which we enjoy. Do we give credit back to God? Do we thank God for each and every blessing in our lives? Have we forgot to thank God for his qualities and his characteristics? Or do we not thank him for his mercy? Do we not thank him for his forgiveness? Do we not thank him for his grace? Let's continue on in Psalm 136. The first thing is, I think many times, we take for granted so many things in life, but we just, do we just take for granted the God which we serve, the good qualities and characteristics which he has? Let's look at something else that the psalmist is really leading us into in verses uh, 4 through 9. There's something else that the psalmist here, uh, this particular psalm, does not want us to forget about when we're thanking God. Starting in verse 4, it says, To him who alone does great wonders. I'm going to skip the, the repeats. It says, To him who by understanding made the heavens. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights. The sun to rule over the day and the moon and stars to rule over the night. Something else that I believe that we should be thankful for that many times perhaps we take for granted is the creation of the world which we live in. We live here. 
We wake up every day. We expect to see that sun. We expect to see the moon. We expect to see all those great wonders and those beautiful things which God has created that God has really made for us as we kind of go throughout this life. We think about the mountains. We think about the oceans. We think about life around. Those things were created by God. Do we take those for granted? The physical space which God has, has granted us that, that he has created. Through that we see his power and certainly we see his, his greatness. And I find it very interesting that when it comes to our society and it comes to our culture, so many times we put people on pedestals that do what? That discover things, that create things. They're like, oh, really? Look at this individual. Look what he created. He created this electric car. Or look at this individual. He created this. Or look at this individual. He created this. Wait, what about the God which we serve? Do we appreciate the things that he has created? The things that he's built? We might look at a structure that's built and look at the way that that's designed. Look at the way that it's structured. Look at the architect and, and look at the execution of those plans. What a beautiful thing that's been constructed. But do we have that same attitude when it comes to God? The uniqueness and, and, and uh, his design when it comes to his creation. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4 it says, For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. Do we take for granted the design which God has designed the world? You know, many people of the past have acknowledged this. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but Isaac Newton, he said, When I look out in the world, he said, I see order. I see design. He said, I don't see chaos. And Isaac Newton says, I, I come to the conclusion that there's a God. When I see the design and I see the order, he says, I think there's a God out there. Do we give God the credit when it comes to creation? Or because it's there each and every day, we forget about it. We, we, we forget to thank God just for the creation and the world which he has created. The systems and the patterns which he's created. When we think about the seasons, we think about the earth being in the perfect place. A little bit this direction, a little bit this direction, we have problems. When we think about the sun and the moon and how they interact, a light for the day and the night. What beautiful design by the Creator. Every house has a builder, and a lot of houses are admired by people. But we admire all the things that God has created. Are we thankful for all the things that God has created? We certainly can benefit from so many things that God has created in our life. And God has put creation really out in front of us, and we see it every single day, are we thankful for it? Because in Romans, really, we have a very powerful argument made about creation in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. It says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What is it saying there in Romans? When you look at creation... You really don't have an excuse not to come to a conclusion that there's a God. Now, I know we have a lot of people in our society that say, Oh, no, that's not a natural conclusion. I don't know what you're talking about. When I go outside and I look at a tree, you know what I think? Where did that tree come from? Well, that came from a seed that came from that tree. And, that, and I just work it back and work it back. And you know what you realize? Eventually, there's got to be a first tree. And when you get to that first tree, you know what you realize? You have to break the laws of science. Cell theory is all life comes from pre-existing life. Well, eventually you've got to get to the original life. So you and I are coming to the same conclusion. Something supernatural had to happen or something eternal has always been here. Either trees have always been here or something supernatural started a tree because we know all life comes from pre-existing life. We can work that back. I can look at my kids and I can work this back, right? It doesn't take a rocket. It doesn't take any powerful thinking. I look at my kids. I'm like, my kids came from me and I came from my parents and they came from their parents and I'll work it back. And eventually you get to a point where you got to say, humans have always been here or it was a supernatural start. We come to the same conclusion. That's what it's saying in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. You're without excuse. When you wake up every day and you get to see the creation that's around us, you might not want to acknowledge it. You might not want to look at it. But what God has created has been designed. And when we use our minds, we can come to the conclusion that there has to be something supernatural, eternal behind this. You even think about the scientific community, which I don't like to call it the scientific community. It's, I mean, atheistic community, agnostic community. When you work your way back, you get to a point where you're like, this has got to be supernatural or eternal. No one's going, this makes perfect sense, right? <laughs> this makes perfect sense when they work it back. No, they work it back and they're like, this does not make sense. There's design. There's power here that we don't understand. We've never seen life spontaneously start. All life comes from pre-existing life. 
Do we appreciate the creation which God has laid before us? A creation that when we look at and we make observations, we really come to a point where we realize that we're without excuse. How hard is it to ignore creation? You wake every morning up to it, but yet somehow we wake up, we go about our lives, and it seems like we don't even have time to look at the sky. We don't have time to appreciate the leaves changing on the trees. We don't have time to watch the sunrise or the sunset and say, thank you, God, for the creation that's around. In Psalm 33, in verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. We stand in awe of God's creation, the ocean, the forests, the mountains, the seas, how everything interacts, how there's patterns, how there's systems, how there's design in the creation. And when we look at that, we are clearly without excuse as we look at the great creation that we get a witness and live in every single day. I'm not saying that I understand everything. In fact, in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. God understands things that I don't understand. He created things in ways I can't explain. But when I look at those things, I am thankful for the God which I serve I'm thankful for those things that he has created. I mean, we think of Psalm 19 and verse 1. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Creation, the design of it, the structure of it, leads us back to the conclusion of a creator. And when you think of all that, you think of the creation, you think of the mountains, you think of the oceans, you think of the sun, you think of the moon, you think about all these things. Think about this for a moment, that God thinks about you. No, not, not you collectively, you as an individual. The creator of the universe is concerned about you as an individual. In fact, in many places in Scripture, God encourages us to reach out and utilize him. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7, it tells us to cast our cares on him, for he cares for you. Wait, the creator of the universe? God who created the sun, the moon, created the earth, created the oceans, created the seas, created all things in... He cares for you. That's what the Bible says. Do we reach out to God in our times of need, or do we isolate him, the creator of the universe? Let's continue on in the psalm. Number one, do we take for granted the good qualities of God, the characteristics of God? Number two, do we take for granted the creation, the great wonders which God has left us? Let's continue on in the psalm. We're actually going to go to the end, and I'm going to skip the, the little repeats, but verses 10 through 26. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them with a strong hand and an outstretched arm. To him who divided the Red Sea into two and made Israel pass through the midst of it. But overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea. To him who led the people through the wilderness. To him who struck down great kings. Uh, Shion, king of the Amorites, and all king of uh, Bashan, and gave the land as a heritage, a heritage to Israel his servant. It is he who remembered us in our low estate and rescued us from our foes. He who gives food to all flesh, give thanks to the God of heaven. When I read verses uh, 10 through 26, what I start to see is the deliverance of God is, number one, we see that we're thankful for God because of his good characteristics and his attributes. Number two, we're thankful for God because of his creation. But when we get into the third point, really, it's given us almost a history lesson. This song is almost like a history lesson. It talks back to uh, the Israelites getting out of Egypt. and says, remember that God got you out of Egypt. That God not only got you out of Egypt, he took you across the Red Sea. Not only did God take you across the Red Sea, he led you through the wilderness. Not only did God lead you through the wilderness, he helped you with your conquest as you went to conquest the promised land and start Israel as a nation with land. As you went that way, he was with you when you got out of Egypt. He was with you when you went across the Red Sea. He was with you when you were in the wilderness. He was with you when you went to conquer Israel. He was with you as you conquered these kings. He was with you all the way. 
And I think it's powerful when it says, who remembered us in our low estate and rescued us from our foes. What is it talking about? We're thankful that God has delivered us. Now certainly this psalm being sung in the Old Testament, they're reflecting on all the things that God had did for them, had done for them in the Old Testament. How God had been with them through all of the ups and downs, had been with them out of Egypt, through the wilderness, through the conquest, all of these things, and said God remembered us in our low estate. And what did God do? He delivered them. Do we forget from time to time that God delivers us? God certainly delivers us spiritually, but have we considered that sometimes God is also there to help us through many of those physical things that we go throughout life. God is there to help us in our low estate. He will remember us in our low estate, and it says He rescued us from our foes. Do we understand that God rescued His people of the Old Testament? He rescued His people in the New Testament, and He rescues us now today. Do we understand... Are we thankful that God has delivered us? A lot of things can happen to you throughout this life. Death, disease, disaster, all kinds of things can happen to you. You know God can be with you through it all. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, certainly the Apostle Paul went through a whole lot. But there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, he says... But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, Icodium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Now we're not necessarily going to be delivered, because actually if you look back, if I remember correctly, when he's in those regions, I think that's when he gets stoned. I'm not saying that we'll necessarily get a physical deliverance every time. I think back to Daniel. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And there before, and they said, hey, we're not going to bow down to this statue, and we believe in our God, we trust in our God, and we believe he can deliver us. But if not, we're still going to do what's right. Paraphrasing a little bit there. You understand that God will deliver you? He might not quite deliver you the way that you want him to deliver you on this physical plane of life, but when it comes to spiritual things, all, work, all things work out together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things will work out in the end. I don't care what happens. I don't care if it's death that knocks on your door. I don't care if it's disease that knocks on your door. I don't care if it's disaster that knocks on your door. If God is with you, he will deliver you. Just like he delivered Israel, just like he delivered the, the apostles. Sometimes he delivered them in a very physical and real way that they felt. Like Paul when he was stoned. He, I mean, God delivered him in that situation. But do we understand that God will deliver us? Isn't that what the, psalm is, the psalmist here in Psalm 136 is talking about? God will deliver you. Are you thankful that God will deliver you? Paul talking again in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. He said, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it, be char may it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. You understand that the Lord will be with you all the way. God was with the Israelites, He was with the apostles, and God is with us. Are we thankful that God is our deliverer? Or do we forget that God is our deliverer? Do we forget that God is with us every step of the way? Are we thankful that God is with us? In Romans chapter 8, verse 31, it says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Are we thankful for that fact? It's, a, it's really, I think, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, it's a superpower of the Christian. A superpower of the Christian is we know that we're already delivered. We know it's all going to work out in the end. It's a superpower of a Christian, and so many times Christians will, will turn their back on that idea. And yet the Apostle Paul didn't run away from that idea. In Philippians he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It'll all work out in the end. It'll all work out in the end. Christians, followers of God, will be delivered. Perhaps not in the way that we would expect in this physical plane of life. But when trials come, when tribulations come, disease come, when difficulties come, when heartache comes, when setbacks come, God is there. And He can deliver us. 
we think of in, in Psalm 136, it starts with the children of Israel getting out of Egypt. It says, oh yeah, he got us, he, got us, he helped us get out of Egypt. And, and when you think about that, them getting out of Egypt, it was like them getting out of slavery. That's exactly what it was, getting out of slavery. You understand that you have a very similar spiritual journey to the Israelites. That God comes and he says, let me get you out of sin. Let me get you out of sin. Let me take you across the Red Sea. You're going to have to go across the wilderness, but you know what? One day you'll be in the promised land. That was his hope. That was his desire for the children of Israel, that they would be in the promised land. But he says, you know what? Right now you're slaves. I've got to get you out of slavery. I'm going to take you across the Red Sea. And then we're going to go through the wilderness. We're going to go through the trials of life. And then eventually we'll be able to go across the Jordan and rest on that shore, the shore of the promised land. See, they had a very physical journey. Our journey is a little bit more spiritual. But are you thankful for the deliverance of God. If he can deliver the Israelites, if he can deliver uh, the apostles in the New Testament, if he can deliver the apostle Paul, can he deliver us from the slavery of sin? In Romans chapter 6 and verse 26, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you looking to God to deliver you? You know, what's interesting about the Israelites when they're on that journey, what does he do? It says it there in the Psalm in 136, is that God is going to lead them. And how does God lead them? When we look in Exodus chapter 13, we see that uh, we have by day, we have the pillar of cloud, and by night, we have the pillar of fire. The Israelites are being led by that. Are you letting God lead you? What would happen if an Israelite just said, you know what, I know that God's got this uh, cloud pillar here, but I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to go over here. <laughs> What if a, a, ch a child of Israel said, you know what, there's this pillar of fire here, but I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to go a different direction. God is trying to deliver you. He's trying to lead you home. How does God try to lead us home today? His inspired word of God. In Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You know how God is going to primarily deliver us today? We certainly have the death of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins, but we understand that this is his light, is it not? The children of Israel followed a light so they could be delivered. Will you follow the light of the New Testament? Will you follow the light of God or will you ignore it? I'm not going to follow that pillar of, of light, uh, that pillar of fire rather. I'm not going to follow that, that pillar of cloud. I'm not going to follow that. I'm going to go my own way. Well, you can go your own way, but you're not going to be delivered. Will you be delivered by following the words of God? There's so many things that we can take for granted throughout this life. But don't take for granted God. Thank God for all that he has done. I think of Joshua. Certainly we have that transition of leadership from Moses to Joshua. Moses gets the Israelites out of Egypt. They cross the Red Sea. They're in the wilderness for a period of time. And then they get to the edge of the promised land. Of course, this is the second time they've been to the edge of the promised land. Moses is going to die. He's not going to go in the promised land. We have a transition from Moses being a leader to Joshua. And perhaps some of the most comforting words, I think probably for Joshua, Joshua chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. What more comforting words could we have? You know God is trying to tell us through the Bible that same message. I was with the Israelites, I'll be with you. I was with the apostles, I'll be with you. I was with the Christians of the New Testament. I will be with you, and I will deliver you. Are we thankful to God for his deliverance? When I look at that Psalm, Psalm 136, certainly I think of, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your good qualities. Thank you, God, for your creation. Thank you, God, for your deliverance. Are we thankful? Think of God's characteristics in relation to you. We're thankful for those. Think of God's creation in relation to you. We're thankful for those. Are you thankful for God's deliverance? Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian or you need the prayers of the church. But before we uh, officially conclude, let me ask you a question. When's the last time you thank God for who he is, for his creation, for his deliverance? If you're subject to the Lord's invitation anyway, we ask you to please come as we stand and as we sing.